Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Hello and welcome to Holistic Emails, Email and More, the Q&A with a lot of people today. There's a lot of people <laughs> today. I am your host, Skip Federa, and for those who, of you who are new to the show, on every episode we showcase a different topic with a different panel of experts. And today we're talking about writing persuasive copy. Now, as you know, this is really your show, and the vibe we always go for is, you know, a chat amongst friends, email geeks in the pub. And we've done our best, like I said, to create, recreate that pub vibe by bringing in a huge panel today. Um, but we bring the experts. It's your questions that actually drive the conversation. It's unscripted, it's unrehearsed, and with this many people and this group of people, it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. So let me get a little bit of the admin -y stuff out of the way. We've got a great show lined up for you, as I've mentioned today. We're going to be talking about what is uh, persuasive copy, what are the key differences between brand-centric and customer-centric copy, how do you achieve that balance uh, of being on brand but also being customer-centric, and what is the biggest and most helpful tip for email copywriters, and this panel is going to deliver all those things, especially that last one on the tips. Really looking forward to that. Before we go any further, I would like to thank our sponsors. We've got our gold sponsors, Iterable and OnGage, and our silver sponsors, RPE Origin and Actito. Guys, thank you all for everything you do to make this series possible. If you've missed Series 1 or Series 2 or any of the previous episodes on Series 3, they are all available on Holistic Email's website, and I'm going to ask producer John to stick the link in the chat. Now, like I've said, we've got a great lineup of speakers for you today. We've got Joe Van Hewitt of Cheeky Wipes. We've got Iman Ismail from Iman Copy Company. We've got Janet Roberts from Content by Janet Roberts. We've got Haim and Melissa Peckel from OnGage. Thank you to them for being our sponsors. We've got Jen Pike from Candidates. And with me as always, it's best-selling author and award-winning thought leader, Kath Pei of Holistic Marketing. Say hello, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hey. All right. So, uh, like I said, this is your chance to ask this great panel your questions about writing persuasive copies. So, folks, get your questions into the Q&A tab on the left. If you put it in the chat, don't worry. I'll still pick it up but it's definitely going to get answered if it's in the Q&A tab. Now, for me, I'm, I, love the, I love sessions like this. I love copywriters. I think copywriters are amazing, and good copywriters are worth their weight in gold. I remember when I started at Ogilvy, it was the first time in my career I actually had access to such a high-level creative department. I was always amazed. I'd get to go, go downstairs to the briefing and, you know, you give the brief and then you just sort of point at the creative team and it's like, go create on demand. And it, they did. And the ideas were brilliant. And you go back a week later or a couple of days later and the ideas were even better still. But I think the copywriting is probably one of the most overlooked parts of developing an email campaign, especially on the brand side. Now, to be clear, I don't think copywriting is overlooked because um, we overlook it or we want to overlook it, I think it's overlooked by other parts of the business. Specifically, I'm thinking the guys in the finance department, right? You hear things like, how hard can it be? Or, I write emails every day. Copywriting is a craft. It takes skill. It takes practice. And if you can get finance to approve a copywriter, then get one. And if you can't, try to find one that'll work for free? No, unlikely. <laughs> if you can't, we're here for you. Right. This is what this panel is here for. So let's get right to it. So I'm going to open up to the uh, to the panel. First question, kind of anybody wants to jump in here, but just a way to get started. Is my perception. Let's start actually on the brands with the brand marketers. Is my perception of how copywriting is respected or not respected still accurate or are finance departments really coming around to? Yeah, it's worth the extra money. We've seen how much better the campaigns perform with good copy. Jen, why don't we start with you? 
You're on silent, yeah, Jen. <clears throat> nope. No. Yeah. While we work on that, Joe, let's start hi. with you. Uh, hi. hi. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, that that's a great question. We're quite a small, um, we're quite a small company, and so we kind of work very collectively. So Helen, our founder, myself, I run the uh, kind of work across the marketing, customer services, and we see very quickly the benefits of excellent copywriting or an excellent approach to our customers. Um, we quite literally, with our email communication system can check how much revenue each email has generated. And from that, we will then go back and tweak or we will look at some of the themes we've done. We'll look at some of the language we've used. And again, as that kind of um, as that kind of small company, I'm very in touch with the customers. I started out there, oh, I don't know, 10, 10 years ago, kind of just looking after customers. And through that knowledge and that engagement with customers, worked out what they want to hear, when they want to hear it, and having all used the products ourselves and we can delve into that another time all the all the people on my team and all the people across the business have all used every single product we have that experience so we know how to be kind of empathetic to our customers and we really incorporate all of that into everything we write the approach we take is very much we know how this works we know how it's going to benefit you here's our tried and tested here's our stories here's our is our experiences. I used some experiences from the summer for myself and my daughter straight into an email when I got back, had a great idea and used it as a as an example. And we answer customers' queries every day. So we're able to put those little nuggets into our emails to really engage to really engage our customers. Mm. Not hard to uh, walk a mile in their moccasins then as it were. Exactly. Work. Yes. Yes. So so Jenna, we got you back. Oh Jen. Nope. No. Oh, Jen. What's happened? You were here it, before. You were here before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right, I'll, tell, well, I'll tell you what, Jen, I'm going to ask producer John to uh, reach out to you on uh, on the phone and see if we can sort that out. Kath, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in because the reason why I asked Jen and Joe to come, um, so Canada Dips and um, Cheeky Wipes are uh, Holistics clients. And the one thing that really, I mean, besides absolutely adoring working with them, I have always been full of admiration for their um, their ability to really stay with the brand voice, but also write persuasive copy. And of course, it's a, it's a it, as Joe was indicating, it's kind of like it's an evolution, right? You kind of work out what works, and it's always about getting that sweet spot enough copy, not too much copy, all that kind of stuff. Because in general, I find. And this is actually one of the exciting things that this is our biggest panel and it's on copywriting. I mean, that's, you know, because normally it's really hard to find an email marketing copywriter, right? So I'm really, really thrilled that we've got so many people who are so passionate about copywriting to come on the panel. But um, I, I think I think that's the whole thing is it's, it's the email marketing team need to really convince the C-suite or whoever it holds a budget that copy writing is really, really important. Even if they were, beca because I find that most brands tend to be too minimalistic. They, they tend to rely on the actual push factor of email to simply sell the products. They're not actually doing the persuasion. They're not actually carrying it the next step and sort of really making it easy and enhancing that customer experience for, for the customer. So I think Yes, the, the, the actual, um, you know, those that hold the budget sort of go, why do you need a, we've got a web copywriter and we're going to come and address that in a minute. We've got a web copywriter. Why do we also need an email copywriter? Um, <clears throat> yet, of course, when they go and have a look and they go see, see how much email actually contributes to the bottom mm -hmm. line, so um, that, that will probably work out and it's worth it. My, my answer to that is always yes. And there's a guy that can paint your house. Now ask him to do your Rembrandt. <laughs> exactly. Different skill set, different <laughs> skill set completely. Um, all right. So, um, how, Jen, how are we doing? I don't know. How are we doing? <gasps> yeah, we are doing great. We are doing great. I was just about to, I was just about to move on on to the next question. But do you want to jump in on on 
the level of respect that email copywriters get in brands? Well, look, I'll agree with all of you guys. There's high respect for people who are really good at their craft. And I think one of the challenges that most talented creatives face across the marketing platform is when you're really, really good, it looks like it's really, really easy. Yeah. And not only that, but marketing in general is the really fun stuff from my perspective, particularly the advertising side of marketing. So from my view, marketing is very broad. It includes pricing strategies and distribution strategies. Nobody wants to jump into that stuff. But when you're talking about an email that hundreds of thousands of people or millions are going to see, everybody wants to put their hands on it because it's so exciting to see your own work in the world. Um, so, Skip, I do agree with you. I think there's a lot of pressure internally to justify hiring and fairly paying for really talented creatives. Um, and that applies to marketing as well as lots of the other channels through which we advertise. But it's only because you guys, you know, you guys are so good, unfortunately. That's the that's the cost of awesome. Oh, I like that. The cost of awesome. That's that's going on a T-shirt right there. <laughs> I, I am the cost of awesome. I like that. Um, <clears throat> so um, so what uh, let's let's shift gears a little bit. Um, and uh, Iman, you haven't had a, 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 a chance to say anything yet. So we'll start with you and then we'll move hey. over to uh, uh, to uh, Haim and Melissa. What makes copy persuasive? I think it's going back to what Joe said uh, when Joe said, you know, really knowing your customers, knowing who you're speaking to, understanding what makes them tick, understanding, you know, their pains, their struggles, their goals, um, what they've already tried, what they haven't yet tried. And so I think so much of it is is customer research, but also just being in touch with your customer, speaking to them, talking to them. And I so agree with what Joe said around, you know, when you're doing the kind of customer service, customer sales side as well, you have such a, a, a unique chance to just get all the information and the data that you need to write really great emails. And so I think often the mistake that brands make is that they start with themselves and because they know everything about their brand, they start with just, okay, what do we know? What do we want to put out? As opposed to what do our audience need to hear? What do they need to hear to go from no, or I'm not sure about this to yes. And what does that journey look like? And from A to kind of Z is all the emails in between. So definitely persuasive copywriting has to start with the audience. And I think um, it can be as simple even as just making sure that you are including your audience, your subscribers in the conversation. So even just the word you, that's, I, I always say this to my clients, one really easy way to just include the audience more and to make them feel, you know, seen, heard, like they're part of a conversation as opposed to being talked at all the time is to use the word yeah. you more often. Mm -hmm. uh, how many times do you use the word you as opposed to we, um, us, our, so I think that's yeah. a really good place to start and uh, when yeah, it comes to being that. persuasive in your email. In yeah. Emails. Uh, there used to be this awesome calculator. So it was just a web. And all it did was um, you could, so for emails, you could just go and copy and paste the, 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 your content in there. And it mm -hmm. will, it's called the wee wee calculator. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. So it's, it's counting wow. how many that's times. That's wrong. So, no, it's awesome. It's got, it counts how many times you're using, you know, we and, and us and our and everything over you, yours, and, and then mm -hmm. it gives you the percentage. And what I found, because I used to use this when I was training for, for copywriting and for email marketing, and um, so what we used to find was there is a, and, and this is probably going to segue over to this other question that we're going to talk about, the difference between web and email. So web you can be a little bit more brand-centric on the web, I believe, right? Mm. Email, though, is coming into their personal inbox and it needs to be more brand-centric. So you do need to have a higher percentage of, uh, of you know, you and, and yours and everything. Yes, exactly. Sorry, customer-centric. Um, and whereas the, the web is, it can tolerate being a bit more brand-centric. <clears throat> and it depends that, on that the makes, <clears throat> But that makes perfect sense to me because... For a web, a website, it's kind of like going to a store. I've gone there, 
right? Mm. So it's I'm in their space, whereas yes. in email, uh, they're in my space. Yes. You know, mm. You're in my space now. Yes. Um, so, uh, Melissa, what are, what, are your, what are your thoughts? What makes copy persuasive? And, and actually, um, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball because uh, you're also a, a B2B brand marketer. Exactly. Exactly. So, so is there are, so are there differences in the B2B side? Uh, not that much. If that's the you know, short answer. So I would say that uh, basically when you speak about a persuasive copy, you are speaking about content that will trigger an action. Uh, it can be either an engagement or a conversion. But as I see it, it all starts with triggering an emotion. Uh, you can't split the act of writing from emotion. After all, from cave painting or pictograms uh, to any form of writing, the goal was always to communicate clearly who you are, what you want, and through that, uh, share what is your experience and what you have to offer. So uh, in this, by telling a story, us human, we love a good story. So the rule to persuade anyone, even for in the B2B space, um, is that what you have to offer needs to be relevant. And it's not different from the customs, uh, you know, we all apply in uh, internal personal uh, relationship. Uh, people want authenticity. Uh, lack of authenticity is something that customer can immediately spot. Uh, the message you want to convey must be clear, and you need always to ask yourself: Am I providing any value? Uh, it's even more relevant when writing emails. Uh, you need them to be to the point, because if you are sending a really long email and you don't want to waste, that's the thing: you don't want to waste anyone's time. Working with authenticity in mind always will get, almost, will get uh, you uh, to solve this uh, problem. So, yeah, short that's, answer, that's, that's that, that much difference. Well, that, you know, the, the, the thing that, um, what you said and, and what Aman said, the, the one thing that resonated through both those answers for me is, you know, I've, I've been in marketing and email marketing um, for, well, let's just say a long time, a lot longer than I want to admit. Okay. And, um, uh, and so, I mean, I know what I'm being sold to, right? I know what I'm being marketed to, but a really well-crafted email, you know, I'll be like four or five yeah. clicks past it and be like, hang on. Yeah. I get here. I exactly. Didn't, I didn't even know I needed to be here. That's great. Okay. Yeah, you know, the other are the biggest suckers for great copy and great marketing. You know, that, that's just a fact. That is, for some reason, not out there. But I don't know. It's 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 a fact. It's a fact. It right? It's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, um, Kath, I've discovered the other benefit to doing a um, uh, an event based on copywriting. The people that write the questions write them very well. All right. The questions we've gotten so far are very well. They're written. good, aren't they? Um, exactly. There's this little, this little feature that I can show the questions on the stage, and sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't really want to show this one. I'm not sure this person's going to be very happy about that. Um, but I'm, I am going to show the next one. And um, Janet, let's start with you. This one comes from Natasha. This is a great question. Um, what's the best way for a copywriter to research a client's customers and then find examples of the way they should speak to put in? to those customers in that copy? That is a great question. And I have an answer that you may not be expecting. Um, one of the best ways, obviously you have your own um, customer research. You should have an idea of who your personas are and who you're addressing in each um, email if you're addressing a specific persona or a segment. But one way, if, you're, if you don't, don't really have a lot of background info, is go to your search team and ask them what keywords are our best search keywords? What really delivers the best for us? For one thing, you're, you're getting in good with them because you're asking for their help. So there's a little bit of you know cooperation between the teams. Unless, of course, you're also the search team in which you would just talk to yourself. But those keywords tell you 
what's on your customer's mind and what's on the mind of people who aren't your customers yet. And that can help you find the terms that resonate with people. You don't have to be so obvious as to work the actual keyword in, but it gives you an idea of what kind of language to use. Um, and then the other part of your question was, and to find examples of the way they speak to put in the customer's copy. If you have a customer support team who takes the phone calls or the customer support emails, go and have a chat with them. They're another untapped resource. If you're in a company that's big enough to handle all that, they are, you know, if not necessarily face to face, they're mouth to ear with your customers and they understand what's going on. And that can inform the way that you write. Do you um, do you write to a, an audience of parents of young children? Like are you writing to Iman, for example, you're going to write differently to Iman than you would to somebody who is, um, you know, is in a B two B world dealing with high finance or high tech. You know, they have totally different issues. They have different attention spans. They just have a, you know, a lot of different things going on. So I would say those two places, reach out of the email inbox a little bit, start with what you know, and then supplement it with these other sources. That's great. That's great. some great advice. I, 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 would pro I might disagree with you slightly on, on being obvious about the keywords, um, but not like don't, it's not, you're not writing SEO copies. So you don't have to like every sentence is actually right. the keyword. Well, I mean, but if it's, one if of the it's things a really that... good keyword, yeah, I mean, go ahead and put it in there um, if it's something that makes Absolutely. sense. If it's if it's something that would stand out and be clunky, obviously you're not going to use it. But um, you know, it's a, right. it's good information. Right. But it, yeah, and I found including keywords uh, in subject lines can can extend mm -hmm. the life of your email, yep. even if people don't open the email. Anyway, right. Iman. Um, so how do you, you you talked a lot about you know, uh, talking to the customer, not at the customer, or to the reader, not at the reader. Uh, but how do you know, what are those pain points? How do you find, the, find that out? Yeah, I love this question because I love customer research. So on the back of what Janet said, um, I totally agree with speaking to customer support. But also, I love it when clients can send me um, recorded support calls or recorded sales calls because then I'm almost like a fly on the wall listening to how the how the customer is speaking about their problems their struggles their goals so you hear it directly from the mouth of the customer which i love as opposed to it being you know secondhand from my client oh this is what the customer says no i get to hear it directly from the customer if they don't have recorded sales calls you can ask them to send over uh, support tickets and emails and customer support emails and that kind of thing as in just forward them straight to me and i'll you know put them all in a google folder and go through all these support tickets and see how these customers are actually speaking about your product or you know your service the the problems struggles pains etc that they're having i think Another great way to get into the mind of the customer is to look at reviews and testimonials. What are they saying in those? Look at the good reviews and, and the bad reviews. Both are just as helpful. Um, and then uh, I do um, customer interviews and surveys as well. So sometimes I'm speaking directly to um, my clients' customers in um, interviews that they've agreed to do. And I'm asking you know, a specific questions and I'll find out through them by speaking to them exactly what I want to know. Um, or I will send surveys. So I will, uh, you know, create a survey and type form. And, you know, the questions that I ask in this survey really depend on the missing, my missing knowledge gap. So what it is that I'm trying to find out or what it is that I'm not understanding. So um, if you give people an incentive to fill out a survey or you even tease at an incentive, so it doesn't have to be, you know, everyone who fills in the survey is going to get X. It could be, if you fill out this survey, you're in with a chance of getting X. So maybe only one, one person wins. Um, people will fill out surveys. People love to tell you about their experiences of things. So that's another way that you can really get into the customer's head and figure out what it is that they're thinking. Even better if you anonymize the survey um, and they, you know, th they really let it all out. But of course, if there's an incentive involved, don't anonymize because you want to be able to get back in touch <laughs> with them. Yeah. So give them the incentive. Right. So give them the option. Right. Give them the option to anonymize because those people who are going to be really honest and open, they won't leave their name. They don't care about the incentive. They just want to share their opinion, which is so great and so helpful. Final thing I will say is speak to both buyers and non-buyers because they're both super, um, super helpful to speak to. 
And Pass just it. <laughs> remember to get the get the appropriate permissions before sending any follow up communications. Come to our GDPR oh, session. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> we don't have a GDPR session. Cass just had this look on her face, like, "Our what? We don't have that. We haven't done that." Um, so uh, I may be throwing Joe. I may be throwing you under under a bus a little bit here, but I couldn't help but notice that when Iman was talking, you were taking notes. So you're either th sitting there thinking, "Oh, this really resonates with me," or "Oh, I yeah. should try that." Either way, what was it? Do you know what? It was It was to both of their points, actually. So Janet, so you'll notice if I kind of piped in and went, oh, yes, the stuff that Janet's saying is really resonating with me. And one of the things that we do is we look at what our customers are searching for. We write a blog on it for the keyword purposes on our site. And then we write an email that links back to the blog. So if we've got five or six blogs being written a month and Helen, our founder, writes them, as does Kirsten, who's on my customer service team, they will write three or four blogs a month they are on the site full of keywords and brilliant stuff. And then I will go and kind of look at the subjects and create emails around that that link back to the blog. So we're kind of driving traffic back to our site and then also putting in the relevant products, which is um, fixing an issue. So one we did recently was the best way to fall asleep on your the best way to sleep better on your period. So we do period pants, reusable period pants, etc. So there was a blog post written about it, brilliantly written by Kirsten. I then put an email together with Megan, who does all our creative on all the top tips. And then, oh, and these are the product, you know, these shorts are really comfy. They're brand new in their bamboo, they're breathable. So we really take those those searches and those keywords and kind of do a whole kind of circle with them, if you like. And then um, the other things that we were talking, that exactly that you were talking about, Iman, is reviews, is we constantly look at reviews. We get, you know, I get the review sent through to me. We use them in emails as well. And we look at kind of what they're talking about. And then again, I'm on, the reason I was writing it down was from a customer service point of view. And again, I've you know had the, the, the great pleasure of running that team for the last kind of seven or eight years. So I, I know what customers are talking about every day. And if we get one issue that is coming up time and time again, well, we'll put out an email that is a Q&A session with the customer service team. So what is Kirsten dealing with this week? What is Erica dealing with this week? What are the questions we're being asked? What are our favorite products for sport, for example? And we can really kind of take all that, that juicy information and use that. And we have a running document that used to be called Joe's Answers to Everything because I was the only one in the team. And now it is the customer services answers to everything. And every time we find ourselves replying the same thing time and again, it goes in our little Bible. And then what we do every now and then is we do an email and we pick out those issues and we make it into an email so that customers think, oh, yeah, I was just thinking about this. And we're answering it for them in an email because we're dealing with it on our live chat, on our on our um, emails and via phone. So, yeah, it's all those juicy bits there exactly that you were saying, Yvonne, that you can see what customers are talking about. And if you put it in, they, they feel heard. They feel they feel heard. They feel like you're not just mm -hmm. going in with a hard sell. You're going in with a how do they know what I was about to ask them? And we're, <laughs> we're, we're preempting them. And it's and I love doing it's that. That's perfect. Although I, I, think you, say, I think you missed Joe, a trick there. I would have left. I would have left the spreadsheet calling call, be, being called Joe's answers I want to, to everything. Say one yeah. thing about Joe's emails, if I could, the voice of the customer is loud in your emails, and I love it. I get oh, wow. cheeky Thank emails. You. I read oh, each yay. and every one, even though I'm kind of a little bit outside. You know, like I'm beyond the kid thing, and I'm not at the grandchild thing yet. Um, but I just, I love reading them because they, they persuade me, you know, even though I'm not really Yay. quite in the market yet. And I just, I love thank reading you. all the reviews. Um, oh, and you. it's just, it's a good That's example a of how to use that. And what, we might get into this later in the call, but you know, if the question comes up about short versus long, I think cheeky is a good example of how to do long emails well. So. Oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that feedback. That's excellent. Thank you. There's, there's an endorsement. I'm not in the <laughs> product, but I'll buy it anyway. Yeah. Uh, Jen, um, how, how, how is what you're doing compared to what, what Joe's doing over there at, at, at Cheeky Wipes? Well, the, the only thing I wanted to add was really um, a couple more channels because I agree with everything everybody said. We rely really heavily on social as well. So I actually write, I, I joke that I'm about 80% fluid, fluent in dude from the US. <laughs> so a lot of my writing is writing as a guy. Um, 
But social media, our consumer base is really super engaged. And a lot of times they're direct messaging us through our Instagram or Twitter accounts, or even following men's conversations um, in Reddit, in some of these other platforms where they are just being themselves and trying to figure out how to solve problems and what works and what doesn't and what's fun and what's annoying. Huge, huge, almost overwhelming amount of insight, perspective, language from those sorts of sources as well. Yeah, and again, that, going back to um, Iman's point, don't just read the good stuff, read the bad stuff. Uh, oh, for sure. Oh yeah. You know, first off, it it highlights where you're missing where you're missing a trick on your out of the box experience, but it also just gives you another way to talk about your product. I mean, depending on what the bad stuff says, you might want to skip out some of those words. You know, it's it's okay being fluent, in dude. It's not okay being fluent in swear words. Um, I, I I feel like everybody's weighed in on this, so I'm gonna you know, might as well go around get the full set in. Um, hi, Melissa, anything you want to add to, to how do you get into your customer's shoes? Maybe, you know, is, is it different from a B2B standpoint? Um, no is an okay that, answer. Um, <laughs> B2B, B2C, you know, we are all people in the end and uh, you, are, you need to talk human, okay? And you need to research on human, okay? I really connected to what Janet said about using the SEO team and uh, their search capabilities as a go-to source. I would uh, also add that uh, there are tools like also Ask uh, that you can use to see which questions are being asked around a certain keyword. Of course, Google also provides you that, that uh, a nice list of, I would not say a nice list, it's a rabbit hole if you start diving in, you know? And you can get lost, but you get all the questions that are being asked around a certain keyword, and you definitely get these insights that you need in order to make your copy more focused on the value that you provide and the user needs and things. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're getting into our user shoes from my perspective. Of course, because I have something else, but you know. From, from these angles, from, from the searches they made uh, in our website, we are getting into analytics and we are checking what they are searching for. Uh, from, the, from, the, from the, I would say, the, the, the content that we are creating, they are visiting our blogs, we are remarketing to our blogs, we see if there is uh, traffic going back, uh, where the traffic is coming from via this channel, that channel, email. Um, yeah. Mm. Excellent. You know, Kath, I, I love. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I love what what um, Heim said about the. Um, at the end of the day, we're all human, right? So we're we're writing to humans because I get that asked a lot about writing to B two B, because they think they're writing to the whole company or something. At the end of the day, you're writing to an individual, and you need to motivate that individual you need to persuade that individual you need to be giving the benefits how are they going to benefit from this and if they're only an influencer then that's fine you don't need to you know so you understand that you're talking to an influencer so you equip them with all the information that they have that they can then go and you know um sell sell the the the, the product or whatever it is on your behalf because of it. So that's the key thing I think that you really need to remember with the B2B difference as well. I just thought I'd pop that in there just because of the B2B. No, that's, that's, that's a great one, Kath. I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day who was like, I just don't understand it. You know, our product saves, saves our clients money. And I'm like, great, but your clients are B2B clients. Your product doesn't save the person you're writing to any money. It's not their money. They don't care about saving money. They're not getting a bonus based on the money. And the person's like, oh, <laughs> it's like, Arr. anyway. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but while we're on the topic of, you know, getting to know your customers and, and, and tailoring your language and Kath, I know this is something you and I talk about a lot. Um, and this is a great question from um, Holly. How would you advise changing your approach with regards to uh, dormant customers versus new or current or, you know, even current, but not very engaged versus current and super engaged. And I'm, I'm sure some of the um, brand markers will want to weigh in on this as well. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I'd love to kick off with this. So there's, I guess, it, I, I wrote an article recently talking about the differences between an inactive customer, no, uh, an in, uh, unengaged customer uh, versus a, like a dormant customer, right? So I'm going, these haven't purchased, but they may or may not have opened and clicked, but they just haven't purchased, right? On that basis, then, um, you could actually segment them both because those that haven't opened or clicked are truly, you know, and you've checked in your system and you know that they haven't gone um, direct to the site, they're not buying anymore. So you know that they are not buying, they're not opening, they're not clicking, but they're still receiving emails. These guys are perfect for you to actually start to realize that, um, and we do this a lot with our clients, there's four main personalities, right? So there's um, uh, that that we as humans sort of gravitate or, or is is unique to us or, you know, um, our individual personalities. And often we will be one or two of these personalities. So um, what you can do is you can start to write and test and put a series in place and everything addressing all four of these personalities because what we have found in our analysis of our customers' emails and everything and understanding how our customer, how our clients write their emails is often in the hands of one, maybe two people. Now, the one, maybe two people have got one, maybe two personalities. Or they might even only have the one. They might be the same kind of personality, right? So, so you, we're talking competitive. We're talking... Uh, humanistic, methodol uh, methodical, um, and what is the last one? The, the one that I am. What's that, Janet? Impulse. Yeah, the impulsive one. The, the, yeah. Um, so, so you, you've got these four basic personalities, and as a marketer, you're very likely to fall into you know um, a very similar one. So that means that when we're writing our copy, we tend to be writing to ourselves to appease our needs, mm. our personality's needs. And we are therefore not meaning to, but we are actually neglecting the other personalities that are out there. So what you're doing, you've got great offers, you've got great everything, but you're not actually appeasing or you're not um, enticing and, and appealing to the, those personalities. So your, your, your um, win back, go in and check it all out. And it's really, really easy to do. Understand these four personalities. Spontaneous, uh, spontaneous. That's the one. Um, understand these four personalities, right? And and I do, you don't have to know them in depth, but understand what motivates them, and you know phrases, offers, things like this, um, uh, even design. And then you can go in and just make sure. So what we do is we'll go and write the copy, and then we go, okay, yep, methodical there, great, spontaneous there, humanistic there, right, and, and competitive here. So we're making sure that we're addressing something there for all of them. Um, and that's a really, really good approach to do. Iman, I saw you nodding a lot there. So I have a feeling you want to jump in. But Kath, um, first off, uh, Janet, you are a wonderful human being because the, the easy answer to Kath's question would have been forgetful. Um, and then... Um, <laughs> no. But, but, but Kath, are you saying... Or maybe this is for everybody. Does this does this mean that um, based on what Kath was saying, that a good cop good copywriters are the most empathetic people? I don't know if it's empathy so much as well. You have to have multiple personalities for one thing. You know, as I'm sure right. Jen knows, um, she's she might be the most <laughs> extreme example of, of the multiple personality. You just you just have to um, put take yourself out of the equation, and and think like your customer. And I think copywriters are on the front lines of that. And we, I have had the discussion many times with clients who say, well, you know, this, you, you need to use this word and it's a big jargony word. And I'll say, but your customers don't use that word. You use that word. Your mm -hmm. customers don't. That word doesn't mean anything to them. And the time you would take to explain what that word means is time and space that you're taking away from selling the benefit, persuading them to go to your website. Um, so, you know, you, you really do have to check your ego a little bit when you're a copywriter. Because it's really, it's not what you want. It's what is going to motivate your customer to act. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. 
those jargony words, venom. <laughs> They're all over the place. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, we I I I moved us off because of the uh, the empathy thing. Um, Iman, you were nodding when Kath was answering. Yeah, I just agreed with yeah. everything Kath said. I think it's so easy to, like Kath said, just write for the type of personality that you have. Um, I can't remember if Kath said this, but I know uh, one of the type, another type or yeah, another type that I've come across is humanistic. So um, those are people who need to see other humans or need to hear from other humans. Like they respond to faces and ex other like stories and experiences from other people. Um, so that's one that I love to 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 go to as well because uh, I am that type of personality. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. I love seeing you know, testimonials, social proof, all that good stuff. And just yeah. to respond to what Janet said, you know, I used to want to be an actress my whole life. And I used to do so much drama and so much. I was in like so many plays and things. And I eventually gave it up. But once I started copywriting, I felt like all of that like drama experience and experience in improvisation and role play, I felt like maybe that maybe it all had to happen for me to become the copywriter I am today. Because yeah. so much of what we do is role play and putting ourselves in other people's shoes and often like many different shoes at the same time so I really related to what Janet said about copywriting being role play and and yes empathy but also putting yourself in everybody else's shoes well I love to hear that that's my daughter's in in drama school <clears throat> learning to be a, a, an actor um, and as a dad I'm thinking I'm not sure there's a whole career future in that um, so it's good to know that copywriting may be a good, yes. good backup. So yeah, um, well, well, you so know, Brit Brittany, my daughter, she's an improv artist, right? Professional improv artist, and she is the most innate marketer I've ever met in my life. She's just yeah. It's so I think you're right there. Go on, sorry. Just that's okay. Uh, any anybody else want to chime in about uh, that? You know what their kids are doing. Yes, yes. You, you don't want to know what mine is doing. So. Oh, now we well. do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, Wait, Skip, could I take uh, just a minute to, to say that I dropped some links into the chat. I hope it went into the group chat, not our speaker it chat. Um, and these are all uh, links yep, to did. posts that, that Kath wrote on MarTech that talk about the things we're talking about today, the, uh, the buyer personalities, lapsed uh, customers and uh, what was the other one? Persuasion versus selling. So for, you know, for all of you who are tuning in, take a note of those and read them later. So yeah, read them later. Don't read them now. Don't read them now. Read those later. Copy them now. Paste them somewhere. Or we, we got some good stuff coming. Um, I, I I am conscious of time and I, we, I've mm. got a, a great wrap up question that somebody put in the Q&A, but I want to get I just want to get into these personality types a little bit with Joe and Jen. Um, do either of you segment based on a personality type or do you try to work each kind of personality type into your each piece of content? How do you, how do you get that to resonate? Joe, you go, you got your finger up. So yeah. I, no, I was just thinking, yeah, I will do. We don't do it by personality type. We do it by, I guess, life stage. So we've got, so as Janet pointed out, we've got kind of parental information. So around our baby wipes and kind of babies, et cetera, all the way up to kind of all our period and incontinence products, which takes you kind of all through pregnancy, postpartum, perimenopause, menopause. And what, and it's very interesting listening to the, the, the bio personalities. And if you look at, you know, myself and Helen, we are slap bang in the middle of that kind of perimenopausal so we kind of we have that mindset and we've got Megan on our team who is early 20s so she kind of takes on that mantle of that kind of younger person so that whole sleeping on your period thing was you know she was looking at it from that point of view where we're just like oh we just go to sleep because we're old and we have kids and we just fall asleep whereas you know kind of younger is that but but on the other side of that from the parental stuff we've all been parents in in our team we've all used all of our products so we very much then kind of take ourselves back to when we were using our products and what we wanted to know. And again, and what we think our customers wanted to know. So we very much base our, our content and our copy on either taking ourselves back, the answers that we needed or the answers that we need now and do it that way. And we very much split it by kind of, by preference type and we're very sensitive to kind of not muddy those waters because it can, it can be very triggering, especially in some of the areas that we're talking about. So we, um, but, but, 
that little nugget of the different bio personalities you know helen and i are very very similar in our personalities so our our copy that we write is quite similar i go from more of a customer perspective she goes from more of the like you know i'm the founder and and this is why i'm i'm doing this um so that's an excellent piece for me to take away and go oh okay in the next few the next few emails i'm writing i'm really going to consider whether i'm putting a bar a slant on it based on me and i'm going to go off after this and have a look and see which one i am but just in that in that terms and it's so that for me is a brilliant nugget as a, on this panel to take away and then to look at how we then kind of take that take that forward excellent I, that I, there's so much in there but yes um <laughs> Now, now you've created the, oh, I hadn't thought of that before. Am I putting mm. a bias in my own copy? Mm. Um, mm. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's a nice little sleepless night you've given everybody in the audience. Thanks for that, Jeff. <laughs> Jen, what about you? How, well, do you con consider personality at all? I think personality and persona is critical. I also, the only thing I want to chime in on is I think the way Kath described it is brilliant. And you combine it with Joe and the reality of her marketplace and her products make it real. I think too many mm. times I've seen in, especially in larger companies, people tend to develop personas. And if you really dig down, it's not very much deeper than age, gender, mm. marital status, maybe part of the country or world where you live in. And it's just so heartbreaking because mm. all of us are so much richer and more complex in our lives and what matters to us than those basic demographics. And I think they're used as a foundation most of the time because it's kind of the easiest, quickest information to get to mm. in a lot of ways. But what really matters is, you know, I could be a new mother at the age of 49. It mm. happens. <laughs> and therefore, I'm gonna be having a whole set of different issues. In some ways, I might look like a 20 year old person who's having a child for the first time. And in other ways, I'm gonna look like a woman in her late 40s who has all those other issues plus plus the kid thing for the first time. And so you don't want to, of course, obviously to get to that kind of micro segmenting doesn't really help all the time, right? Because you can only do so much, but I would just encourage, and I'm such a loud advocate for, if you are going to segment on persona, make it an actual material persona that drives how people feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's a great, yeah, don't make it fluffy, um, no. and and don't give it. I um, I was once, <laughs> I was once giving a presentation or a, a real life presentation with like an audience in the room and all that kind of stuff. You remember those days? <laughs> and um, I uh, put a slide up and it just had a stock image in it, and three um, three people in the front row all had a giggle, and I'm like, oh no. Like I wasn't sure where marketing had gotten this, the image from. And it, that was the only thing on the slide was this image of this guy in a suit. And I'm thinking, oh, what what could have possibly gone wrong? So afterwards, walk over. Oh, how would you think it went? Would you get a lot out of it? And, they, and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, couldn't help but know she had a giggle in the middle. And I wasn't telling the joke. And they're like, oh, um, the picture you had up is the stock image we use for one of our personas. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. And it was just, you know, generic, old, Not bald, white guy in a suit, basically. Yeah. Could have been me, pretty much. Okay, yeah. so I am conscious conscious of time. Um, my wrap-up question was going to be the final point of the deliverables for this presentation, the promise that we've all made to the audience, which is around, um, you know, what's your best tip? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that slightly because we got this brilliant question um, from Alia. If you can't hire an experienced copywriter and you can't afford one of the brilliant copywriters on this call, I added that bit, uh, and you have to go with a junior copywriter, what should you look for? What should you ask them? Um, especially if they're, you know, they're talking to a game, but they're not giving you any real world experience. And and then if you did hire them, what, what tip would you go on to give them? So we're gonna start with Janet, because you're sitting next to me on the screen, at least on my screen, why don't we start with you? <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, well, I will agree. First of all, good copywriting does not come cheap. Um, and the fact that so many companies 
outsource their copywriting means that it's it's easier on their budget to not have the copywriter with all of the associated expenses that come with it. Um, if you have to go with a junior copywriter, what should you ask them? I, I'm assuming this is like during an interview or something. I would actually ask them to write something. Um, not, not do, you know, that heinous experience of having them come up with an entire email campaign before they, you know, will even get a second interview. But just, you know, give them, give them an example of a brief, okay, a, a well thought out mm -hmm. brief that maybe is a little more specific than you normally would be. And give them 20 minutes to come up with copy and see how they do and judge them on the questions that they ask. First of all, do they, do they ask questions or do they just, you know, take it away? Um, and then and look at that and see, are you getting something that you could work with or is this something where clearly the person has no clue? Um, and then go from there. So that would be my tip. That's a great just, tip, yeah. Kath. No, I was just going to say, you, I think you hit the nail on the head there because I'm thinking of when I work with excellent copywriters, that's the one thing that really stands out. They ask lots of questions. They really, really do, right? And so, uh, again, you need that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that most people can be trained with most things. You just need the passion. You need the, you know, the, 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 not, not devotion, but you know what I mean, <laughs> their dedication um, towards it. And so you can train them to be copywriters. There are naturally, there are natural copywriters for sure, but you know that you may or may not find one of those. But I think, and this isn't to sort of put copywriters down, not at all, because I think they're absolutely f phenomenal. But I think that with good training, most people can, particularly when we're talking about email, because we're not talking about. Um, um, you know, copious amounts of copy um, and, and remembering what the role of email is. The role of email is actually to drive you to perform an action on the website. So it's just simply to be enough information to persuade them, to motivate them to move over. So therefore, um, yeah, I, I would definitely be looking at those questions um, and, and looking at to see how excited they are, how passionate they are, how, how much they're going to embrace being um, copywriter. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I once did an exercise with a large telco brand here in the UK, um, and they had a specific tone of voice, and they believed that everybody could write in their tone of voice. And they put us, everybody in the agency that worked on the client through an exercise. And the final exercise of the day, it was like a day-long workshop, and the final exercise was finish, basically finish this, ch this chapter. And it was a chapter, it, you got the first half of a mm -hmm. chapter from, I think it was a tale of two cities and you had to finish it in the style <laughs> of Dickens and, and, and then they read them out and to see if we could pick out who was Dickens and who was the writers. So I, I think there is something to, to what you're saying there. Jen, you, um, you wanted to jump in there. Yes. Cause it's what both of you said, except I would have them write two things. So I would brief them in things that are forcing a little bit of flexibility and their ability, like a mom was talking about, how agile can they be? How many different roles can they assume? How many different scenarios can they get comfortable with in a short period of time? And I think if they, you know, if they're like, you want me to write two things in 40 minutes? Oh, well, then they're not very interested in it. They're not jazzed up about coming to work for you. And it takes yeah. more time from us as well, but I think investments in people is never wasted time, even though we're all so time pressured. I would much rather take twice as long with somebody to see really where can they go, um, just to test that ability for them to be a little bit beyond themselves and, and match the moment or the need. Okay, okay, Iman? I... So Janet and Kath said what I was going to say, so I had to, I had to change <laughs> my answer. But on the back of that, I do want to say that I recently hired someone and I knew in my initial briefing call with her that she was going to deliver a terrible project to me because she asked 
not enough questions and the questions that she did ask were all the wrong questions so really uh, um listening to the questions that this person is asking you it's a really good way to figure out if yeah. if they're on the right track or you know where they're going with this if they're going to be any good because as i think as you get more experience in copywriting at the beginning you're scared to ask your client questions and then you realize that the key to getting this right is always in those questions so you be you your confidence grows and you become much more confident asking those questions so a confidence a confident copywriter will always ask you a million questions um but i did change my answer because i didn't want to beat that horse um so i would yeah sorry i love animals love horses sorry um i would say <laughs> okay. um ask them i think a good question to ask a junior copywriter is emails that they like, like which brands are putting out emails that you like, because passionate email copywriters are following brands. They're reading other people's emails or the brand's emails. They are dissecting them. They are starring them. They are, you know, signing up to like loads of brands just to read their emails. And so that passion uh, comes across when, when you ask a question like that, they, they should be able to tell you. Um, which brands emails they love and, mm. and why as well. Um, doesn't necessarily tell you they're a great copywriter, but it does show you that they're passionate and that they understand what goes into great emails and are, and are wanting sure. to, to get better. They're and heads improve. in the game. Yeah, exactly. They're heads in the game. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Haim and Melissa. Yeah, actually, it's funny. Um, I will be very close to what uh, Ivan is saying. You know, give them to read a lot of bad emails. You know, you learn much more from bad emails to having, you know, the best practice and things like that. So, um, yes, uh, the thing that I will check with the uh, junior is with the ability to research, you know, to uh, be extremely uh, proactive because everything you can learn but you know the attitude and the passion for writing it's not something that uh, you know uh, we are all born with yes and um, and uh, even if it's giving you a crappy uh, you know uh, piece of content if is really trying and and you know researching you know I I believe that there is um, uh, material, you know, to uh, to work on, and, uh, and this is something that's happened a lot. Like like you, yeah, like you all know, it's very difficult to find uh, very good content writers, and especially that specialize in the emails. That's we need to to do with what we have. So you have to be this monitor, but you need to have the uh, base, um, which are you know the motivation and those ability to research. I mean, Okay. Yeah. Haim, do you want to add to that or? Did sure, you sure. I, at one time, Melissa and I really thought about uh, creating an anti-competitor to great email copy. And, uh, you know, just have all those bad emails there and then sending, you know, the juniors to research uh, that website as well. Uh, we didn't pick it up. Go read a bunch of crap. Everyone, you know, <laughs> just take it, take it, and put it out there. We, we would thank you, and uh, because you learn so much more from that copy, you know. And when when someone returns, and you know, it duplicates this side of the equation, that side of the equation, you know who he, who he is. And a funny story on bad copy, something that. I at the time perceived as bad copy. There was a stage when we had our own agency that uh, we encountered an email sequence that was so horrible. We went, yes, we can we can definitely do that better. We, we know the audience. We, yeah, it was a mess. And uh, you know, we, started, we just we just started and it performed like ten percent in terms of performance of the really bad copy that was out there and. And we were, we were, you know, we were at no words at all. We, we didn't know what to say. We just did. It's probably ex experience. You, you need to know your audience. Maybe that specific audience loves really bad copy of that level of communication. I could not explain that. When it's really bad, it's cute, actually. <laughs> when you're really bad, you're like, oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is that. Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a, an expression in the American South where you go, oh, bless. Yes. <laughs> bless your That's, heart. You know, oh. oh, you tried. So, uh, yeah. So, okay, uh, Joe, I feel bad because you're last. 
That's fine. Um, I don't think I've got anything to add. I think so. We recently took on a, a marketing exec that works very closely with us, and we really liked her in her first interview. And for her second interview, we sent her some products, and we said, "Come back to us with uh, a couple of social media posts and an email campaign." You know, an, an email, one email, not a whole campaign. That would be cruel. And you know, and we basically said, "You know, you've you've researched the company enough to want to come and work for us." So. What you know? What are your interests? And we sent her our new kind of pet range stuff, and she had a couple of dogs. And she came back to us with images with her dogs using the product and the benefits. And and we were like, you get it, you 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 get us. And so I think research, um, getting them to to do a piece, but giving them, you know, I think she had a week in between first and second interview to do it. And you know, and we pointed out in in the second interview right before we went yes you're brilliant you can have the job it was more about you know yes these are all the things that you've completely ticked the boxes um and you know and she's been with us six seven months and and it's really and she's a junior she's a, she's a you know she's a young girl and she's she's a junior but she's she learns really quickly and she she's learning about the brand and she one of the things that she does is she answers all the comments on our facebook posts from customers so she is now instead of my team doing that she goes in every morning to all our Facebook posts and answers the comments. And that is giving her that experience of working alongside the car. Otherwise it could be quite isolating. She would just be writing good copy and content and creating beautiful things. But again, she's now building up that background knowledge. So I know I can't bang on about it a bit, but that that kind of mind of the customer really, really works. And, and anybody can do that. They can be a senior copywriter, a junior copywriter. They know how to use the products or the services and they, and they kind of empathize with with customers and are able to advise customers, then that's when they can start to build that build that in. That's a great way to end. That's a fantastic. That's a lovely story. Oh, thank you. You know, <laughs> they, you, know you hired somebody, they, they got it, they did it. Yeah. Um, they nailed it and good for yeah. them. Yeah. Um, so that's all we have time for today. Unfortunately, I could go on this, I mean, to be fair, we only got to one of my questions, so I'd be happy to keep this conversation going for another hour, but I'm not sure uh, anybody else would uh, uh, stay around with us. So that's sad. Anyway, um, folks, give us, uh, let us know your thoughts um, uh, on the topic, on the format, by adding some comments into the chat. We, we read all those. Um, and please join me in giving a big thanks again to our gold sponsors, Iterable and Ongage, and our silver sponsors, RPE Origin and Actito. Also, I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't say thank you enough to our great panelists. Um, mm -hmm. Some amazing insight today, fantastic conversations. Um, it, was, it was wonderful. It was a real treat. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, and mostly, uh, thank you, audience, for spending some time with us today. Now, big news, Adiola Soul will be back in the host chair on the 15th of November with our 2023 Trends Show. Uh, it'll be the last episode in the series, so go make sure you register now. Until then, be safe and make good choices.